The world we live in is only part of a huge, seemingly never-ending puzzle. Just when we think we have reached the limit of creation, and have seemingly worked out our place in it, another piece comes into play that changes everything. Still, that said, it would probably come as a shock to most people in the year 2457 to know that the history, nature, and creation of the omniverse our world exists within is understood to a certain extent. Much of it still eludes even the greatest experts, but overall, we probably understand its purpose at least about as well as we mere mortals could ever possibly hope to. Ultimately, however, this knowledge is kept from the rest of the world for two reasons. First, to prevent the timeline from being changed. The information contained here will also cover our future and will even help shape it, as well as our past, by giving important knowledge to select future history makers, who shall be the only ones ever to read this. All the information about the future comes from the time travellers known as the Circus family. Another reason is that even if we could somehow change history, this information would most likely do more harm than good. In our never-ending quest to figure out why we are even here, humanity has clung to numerous creation myths as a source of comfort to the point that we most likely could not cope with the truth. From the belief of a benevolent creator watching over us, to the idea that we just sprang out of nothingness, and there is no higher purpose than our own destiny, these creation myths give us a hope that our own creator sadly never could, even when he was watching over us. Though that's not to say that all of our myths were necessarily on the wrong track, at least in some of their key ideas. We do have a creator, for instance, but again, as we will see, he is not a being you should ever put your faith in. It would be wrong to call him a complete monster, but ultimately, it seems, there is no truly divine being. The first section of the history of our omniverse, its creation and the early life of its creator, will be covered here. It should be mentioned that this document will focus largely on our own Earth. Naturally, we have more information about our planet than any other, but still, at the risk of offending our Venusian and Zeta Reticulan friends, our planet has in all fairness often been at the centre of some of the most important events in the history of the Omniverse. However, at the same time, that does not mean that we are any more special than other species. Our planet has more been unlucky than anything else with some of the attention it has received. As we already explored in the previous chapter, all realities originate within a place called the Void, an eternal nothingness. As there are no rules in the Void, then anything can potentially happen. Worlds, realities, and planes of existence we can't even begin to comprehend all regularly pop into being within the wasteland of the Void through any means. Our universe, meanwhile, or rather omniverse, whilst coming from and existing within the void like all others, has perhaps a more unconventional origin. The story of our plane of existence really begins in another universe within the void, where our creator originated. We still do not know the name of the creator. Whilst many civilizations have given him different names, ultimately this is all we will be referring to him as in this article. Contrary to what many religions and belief systems refer to him as around the world, the creator is not a god. The gods of many religions, from the Odin to the Yahweh, are as much his creations as we are. Not much is known about the creator's reality. Most of the information about his personal history, at least to us in the 25th century, came from when the circus family briefly travelled into the creator's mind in an effort to heal him after he was wounded by the destroyer, though more on that later. They saw glimpses of his memories, most of which were too vast even for these travellers. How exactly he was able to devise realities and life forms is something that they could not even begin to comprehend, and it most likely will never be understood. Nevertheless, the circus family 
was still able to piece together a brief outline of his history. This, coupled with the myths that had already been built up around the creator on ours and other worlds around the galaxy that we have had contact with, and our own existing knowledge of the supernatural and other realms, helped us to create a more complete, though still vague, outline of the Omniverse. According to the Circus family, unlike our reality, there was no space between the worlds of the creator's home universe. There were still distinctive worlds, some even with their own rules, but they were all linked together to such an extent you could literally walk from one to the other. Sadly, just as in our Omniverse, several of the different sentient life forms of this universe came to war with one another over petty differences. Many believe this is why the Creator would make the planets in our reality so far apart. Not that that stopped there from being interplanetary wars. This war, though, beginning with just a few primitive species, eventually spread and engulfed almost all life forms of this universe. Entire cultures and species were destroyed, and some worlds were rendered permanently uninhabitable. The being that we would one day know as our creator, whose species were the most advanced and had tried to keep out of it, eventually sought to bring an end to the wars by uniting the warring factions under his rule. The creator ultimately triumphed where others of his kind had failed, as he was far more ruthless, utterly dedicated to his cause, and a charismatic, powerful leader the soldiers could get behind. Furthermore, his desire to effectively conquer these other worlds was framed as simply wanting to help them, to make up for their inaction in the war, which many of their leaders bought into at first. Meanwhile, the only reason our future creator was able to conquer this universe in the first place was because overall it was not as large as even one of our universes. It was, at most, the size of a few solar systems, with each world only being half the size of our own. Still, to have conquered even that was a truly incredible achievement that was ironically forgotten in light of what he later accomplished. Eventually, however, the Creator's empire fell. Whilst it is not clear how exactly, it appears from his own guilt that the Circus family could at least feel. The Creator was not as benevolent or effective a leader as he had hoped, and after the fall of his empire, he was forced to flee his entire universe to escape retribution. Due to how small his universe was, unlike ours, his people had known about the Void from very early in their history. Still, even with that knowledge, there had only been a few expeditions to the Void, most of which had been failures, but with no other choice, our creator travelled there in the hopes of finding another reality to hide in. Not long after he entered the void, however, the creator's ship was attacked by creatures known as ethereals. As we explored in the article about the void, though universes constantly keep popping into existence in the void through any means necessary, only a small fraction of them are able to remain stable. Many either fade from existence completely or denigrate into ethereal worlds, and in some cases, individual ethereal beings are left behind, trapped in a nightmarish, ghostly state. The creator, however, unlike other explorers to the void before him, realised that the ethereals could be used to benefit him. When one of these creatures broke its way into his ship and tried to possess the creator in order to have some kind of a body, the Creator's iron will allowed him to fight the creature and effectively absorb it into himself. In doing so, he not only gained all its knowledge of a world that had almost come into existence and other worlds like it, he became much stronger too. In time, the Creator absorbed millions of ethereal creatures into his body, allowing one at a time into his ship at first. The stronger he became, however, the more he was able to absorb several hundred, even thousands of ethereals at a time. Eventually, he was able to absorb entire ethereal realities, 
which gave him a power several million times that of all beings we would later call gods combined. This power and knowledge changed his personality to a huge and in many ways catastrophic extent. Most believed that the creator had been driven mad with the knowledge he absorbed into his mind being too much for any being to take. Some have even argued that a new being was created in his place, who was simply affected by the memories of the old. Still, the creator did claim to the few of his creations he trusted that his epiphany had been caused by seeing the suffering and pain from the ethereal beings and realities he had absorbed. For the first time after feeling their pain, the creator realised the full extent of the horrors he had carried out in his home reality, and wanted to make amends. Unfortunately, however, that did not mean he would try and make it up to his people. On the contrary, he felt that their war would never end. Indeed, since he left, the war had continued on to an even greater extent. It was better to destroy his reality now, rather than allow them to suffer for centuries more until they inevitably killed themselves off. The creator had contemplated changing them to be completely different life forms, but he felt that would be no different to killing them, and he also worried, given how inherently violent his people seemed, any trace of their old selves could lead to corruption, and so he completely destroyed his entire home universe in an instant. Following the destruction of his old people, the creator developed the first multiverse that one day would become the original part of our omniverse. Whilst it had gone by many names, our omniverse is usually referred to as both the Omega Omniverse and simply Sentenza. The former name was given to us by inhabitants of the Alpha Omniverse, who visited our reality first, whilst the latter was what the creator referred to the omniverse as. Apparently, Sentenza is a word from his language, though no one is quite sure what it means. It has been suggested to be children, home, redemption, or rebirth. The first multiverse of Sentenza, meanwhile, was known as the heavenly realm. In this context, realm is simply another word for multiverse. In total, the heavenly realm contained several hundred thousand universes, all of which were similar to ours in some respects. All the universes had planets, a space between them, and stars. However, unlike our reality, the space was white whilst the stars were blue. The heavenly realm also had different natural laws to either our reality or even the creator's. All of the native life forms within the heavenly realm were referred to collectively as angels, and all of the worlds they lived in, from their perspective, were paradise planets. The landscapes of each planet of the heavenly realm tailored themselves to fit each angel's wishes to some extent. Angels were also compelled towards acts of benevolence too. The creator hoped the heavenly realm would be his perfect world, where suffering and hatred had no place, and he hoped in time that the angels could convince other life forms in other worlds throughout the void that there was another way. He did not wish for them to conquer other worlds, of course, but simply show them what could be accomplished if they worked together and provided help if they wanted it. Any worlds that were beyond redemption, the Creator would destroy just like he had done his own. The Creator even hoped that the angels could help the ethereals find a way to exist too. Sadly, however, whilst the angels in their early days were able to help some other universes and realities outside of their own in the void, eventually some of the angels became corrupted by the power they had over other life forms, as the Creator naturally made the angels strong enough to defend themselves and granted them immortality. The Creator, however, had seemingly prepared for the angel's corruption, not only through, in his mind, eliminating it from their bodies, but by putting in a fail-safe for any angel that still found a way to go against its nature. 
This failsafe wouldn't kill an angel. Instead, it twisted its form until the angel became a creature known as a devil. These hideous abominations were then imprisoned within the lowest layers of the heavenly realm, in the hopes that they could one day be rehabilitated. Devils are not to be confused with demons, who we will be exploring in greater detail later. The creator was shocked and horrified that his seemingly perfect children were beginning to fall into the same trap that his own kind had, as more and more devils were born in each generation. Eventually, the creator came to see the angels as a failure. He believed that his mistake was in eliminating the concept of evil from their minds, meaning that when they were tested, such as meeting less powerful life forms in other universes that they could exploit, they had no strength to fight against it, or even recognize what it was. In their minds, because they had always been told they were benevolent, then anything they did seemed kind and righteous, even if it obviously wasn't. Rather than destroy the heavenly realm, however, whose inhabitants he still believed were greater than his own people, though that may have been ego more than anything else, the creator devised another multiverse, known as the godly realm, who could teach the angels and others the concept of evil and how to avoid it. Now this realm was connected to the heavenly realm, travel between any universe within the heavenly or godly realms was possible, if a little difficult. It certainly required less than travelling from any universe in either the heavenly or godly realm to another reality in the void, something both the gods and angels were only able to accomplish with the creator's help. The godly realm, again, had planets with stars and a space between the worlds. The space, however, was purple, whilst the stars were green. All of the native life forms, naturally, were referred to collectively as gods, and they all possessed much greater power on average than the angels. Gods, unlike angels, had a concept of right and wrong, and the creator hoped that they would eventually choose right. He did somewhat guide them, however, by giving the gods a desire to satisfy their own pleasures above the angels. The greatest pleasure for a god is the satisfaction from helping others. But unfortunately, many gods misinterpreted this as worship and would do anything they could to obtain that. Other gods, meanwhile, believed they could derive just as much pleasure from other pursuits and became hedonists. Sadly, however, nothing could ever satisfy them as much as helping others, and the hedonistic gods often overindulged to an insane extent to try and get the same sense of pleasure. The creator also gave the gods the power to control the world around them, hoping that with this they would be forced to work together, and whilst that did happen in many instances, sadly some gods, through various means, were able to gain power over other members of their kind too. Wars were fought, and whilst just as many benevolent gods as evil gods existed, the creator still regarded them as a failure and worked to try and build another realm. The natural realm, as it came to be known, was bigger than either the godly or heavenly realms. Both only had a few thousand universes each, whilst this realm had several million. The natural realm is the multiverse our reality belongs to. All of its creatures, from humans to dinosaurs to any alien life such as our Zeta Reticulan friends, are referred to collectively as naturals. As we know, our universe and all others in the natural realm that have been explored are bound by very strict laws. All of the creatures have natural lifespans, and all of them reproduce to continue their species, unlike angels and gods, who simply create other members of their kind when they want though even then, they have to run it by other members of their kind first. The creator had removed mortality from the angels and the gods because he felt that death was cruel, wasteful and unnecessary. Though only for his own children, hypocritically, he had no problem in dishing it out to unworthy life forms in the past. Still, after seeing the failures of the gods and angels, he came to believe 
that it was necessary for progress. Only once one generation had passed and its mistakes were known by a new generation with a new outlook could a race truly move on. Also, he felt the fear of death motivated life forms to make the most of the time they had. Furthermore, whilst there are more universes in the natural realm, they are finite too. Each universe, it is believed, has a span of several hundred trillion years, though even then it can be hard to determine, as what may seem like the end of the universe for us is merely it going through another phase of its natural life cycle to allow different kinds of life forms to exist. Still, all natural universes do eventually die, after which they are replaced by another universe and on and on the cycle goes. All universes in the natural realm run parallel to each other, and all die, and are replaced at the same time. This would prove a problem for our universe, as the survivors of the previous universe before ours survived its destruction and attempted to reconstruct our universe to suit them. As they had evolved from a different phase of their universe's life cycle, then the first stage of our universe was not habitable for their kind. Unfortunately for these creatures, however, time travellers from our universe's future arrived to stop them, in order to ensure that their version of events could happen. These time travellers were led by the heroic vampire scientist wizard, Professor Fang. This war, known as the Battle for Creation, endured for many centuries, before the time travellers won. It included time travellers from other realities, and even realms, whose history would also have been affected had the creatures from the before universe won. The natives of the natural realm, meanwhile, or naturals, are all driven purely by a desire to survive above any inherent morality. Their bodies, in contrast to the gods, are also forced to adapt to the environment around them. The creator was giving the natural creatures a much harder life than those of his previous two children, but he was desperate. His own world, and now both of his creations, had succumbed in some ways to evil, as had even many of the ethereal worlds. He was, for the first time, overcome with some regret at destroying his people and the other worlds he had cast judgment over. He realised that his people were not evil like he had assumed. They were no worse than any other species, it seemed, as all were capable of evil, no matter how pure he tried to make them. The creator now even began to wonder if evil was stronger than good, and if he should just give in to the evil inside of him. The natural realm was an experiment to prove that good was greater than evil, with the creator hoping that the naturals, who were forced into a desperate existence, would choose good over evil and work together to overcome their hardships. It should be noted that whilst the natural realm was certainly not as hospitable for its natives as either the heavenly or hellish realms, the creator did include a powerful force within it that we would come to know as magic, which, if accessed, could allow natural creatures to overcome the problems of their own realm. Sadly, however, the naturals were another disappointment. Like gods and angels, there were just as many ruthless as empathetic natural creatures. There were just as many who wiped themselves out over the pettiest of differences as those who bandied together in hard times. Following the failure of the natural realm, the creator who by this point had been pushed to his limit, but still did not want to give completely into evil, devised another realm of darkness, horror and fear that would come to be known as the Hellish Realm. This multiverse, which was comparable in size to the heavenly and godly realms, followed the same basic structure as the others, in that there was a space between worlds and stars, though the space was red and the stars black. However, its laws were very different, and its creatures, who were referred to collectively as demons, were all drawn towards acts of malevolence. The hellish realm 
was an even more hostile environment to its natives than the natural realm. Each planet had a molten core of dark energy known as Daemonac that every few thousand years created hundreds of new demon species. Like naturals, most demons reproduced. However, like both gods and angels, many of them were immortal, or at least had extended lifespans, meaning that the new generations were forced to kill their forebears in order to survive. Some demons, however, instead fled to the natural realm. Demons on average were far stronger than the majority of natural creatures making the latter easy meat. Though naturals could not only defend themselves with magic, but numerous natural elements on planets could also act as poison to demons. Examples of this include wood and the rays of certain stars such as our sun being able to kill vampires, or silver being able to kill werewolves. The creator hoped with the hellish realm to prove that whilst evil will always find a way to poison even the most perfect societies, at the same time even the most evil creatures, such as demons, can find redemption. Sure enough, many demons were able to fight their urges and become decent, kind, even heroic creatures. Overall, just as many demons became benevolent as angels became devils. Ironically, the hellish realm in this respect could be considered the creator's most successful experiment. It was certainly the only one where he got the results he desired. Nevertheless, the creator was still unhappy, as he was not sure if good was truly stronger than evil. All he had proven was that they were as strong as each other, and so he decided to conduct one final experiment with the realms he had already created. The creator gave a select group of demons vast power beyond all the gods and angels to see if they could overcome the forces of good. The leader of these elite demons was Kastran, who, according to legend, was the first demon ever to exist in the hellish realm. He was also judged to be the most evil creature in any universe the creator had either originated or visited. Kastran and his vile horde destroyed thousands of universes and an incalculable number of planets before he was eventually slain by an alliance of angels, gods and natural creatures. Even then, however, Kastran only lost because one of his own minions, another member of his species known as Drosak, betrayed him. Even the demons were both disgusted at, as well as victims, of Kastran's cruelty. The creator was satisfied with the results of his experiment. He believed that it proved that good would always triumph over evil for the simple reason that evil will eventually destroy itself. Kastran, despite being more powerful than any individual god or angel, still lost because they were able to work together, whilst his cruelty turned his own kind against him. Following this, the creator, now accepting that evil would always remain, but never completely dominate, not only allowed his previous realms to continue existing, he created many more, all of which would be attached to his original four realms, forming our Omniverse. He did so out of both curiosity and, in his own mind, to make up for the destruction of his and other people by creating more life. He tried to bring back other worlds he had destroyed, but sadly, that was beyond even his powers. He did, however, provide help to other worlds in the void, and in this period he also took part, along with many other powerful life forms and advanced civilizations in the void, in creating what we would come to know as the Great Beyond. This reality, which is not part of any omniverse, is nevertheless said to act as the afterlife for ours and multiple other realities. It also creates multiple copies of itself, which act as afterlifes for potentially all realities in the void. Some argue that even ethereals are sent there. The Great Beyond is referred to as such because it not only represents the final phase of life, but is also completely unknown to us. Only very few people's souls have returned from it with any kind of memory of the experience, and even those who do only have vague flashes. 
They have all described it as peaceful, however, and it seems that the creator, after playing a part in developing it, felt he had achieved some kind of redemption. In fact, he ironically became somewhat callous after this point in how he treated his life forms i.e. being willing to create more realms like the natural and hellish realm that could be quite hostile to other life forms, not to hurt them, but just out of curiosity. Many believe that he was more willing to do this as he knew that they would be sent to a happy afterlife for all eternity, with their difficult lives in this realm therefore only being a minuscule part of their existence. Still, whilst the great beyond is the end destination for all life forms, as we will see, Sadly, there are some instances where souls can be diverted from it and even destroyed. Even then, however, it is believed by some cultures that a destroyed soul will still reform in the great beyond, though there is currently no proof for this. Among the other realms the creator devised during this period included the Aqua Realm, where the space between worlds was an ocean filled with creatures, and where each planet had no water of its own, the Savage Realm, where all the creatures were compelled to hunt one another and were referred to collectively as beasts, and finally a realm where magic was the dominant force. The creator generally did not interfere in the affairs of these worlds, as he genuinely wanted to see how the life he started would develop. Despite his power, the creator was not omnipotent and did not in fact control any life forms in his omniverse. Whilst he could create environments where life could develop and certainly influence life, even he could be surprised by the forms it could take. Drasak, meanwhile, took over as the king of the hellish realm, with he and Castran's race, the hideous Cardons, still being at the top of the hierarchy in hell. Drasak proved to be an effective leader. Whilst cruel and sadistic, he did not believe in demon supremacy and never made any attempts to try and conquer the other realms like Castran did. To be fair, Castran never really believed in demonic supremacy either. He simply used it as propaganda to satisfy his own insane lust for power and sadism. The new king of the hellish realm believed in the natural order and was happy for his demons to attack other realms, but he never really offered any protection for them unless it suited his own interests. He viewed demons versus other life forms as a fair fight. Overall, Drasak was more beloved by demons than Castran, as they had more free will under his rule, being able to indulge in any of their twisted urges and desires, rather than Castran's war. Sadly, however, there were still Castran loyalists who believed in demonic supremacy. 66 million years ago, the last of these Castran loyalists attempted to revive their fallen ruler at the site of his death, which was in our universe. In the next chapter, we will explore how Castran's resurrection would devastate our planet and lead to the creation of humanity's greatest adversary, the Vampire.